Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. All right, so let's get first started here on the strength and conditioning side. This will be part one that we're going to dive into. I think this is one of the more popular areas that I get questions about. I have a lot of questions, you know, emails, DMs, stuff like that about how can I get the athletes that I work with stronger and what do you do for certain exercises and what do you think is really important for, you know, the processing of gymnastics across like an entire season. So I took the five questions that I thought were probably the most common ones that I get from this batch, combined them together and tried my best to make sure they were spread out a little bit across the uh, topics that we usually cover. So um, the first one here comes from Kim and Kim says, uh, I'm a huge fan of your strength and ideas and philosophy, but it seems more focused on optional gymnasts who are in the gym 20 plus hours per week. How can I use it with my lower level gymnasts who only train six hours per week? So I thought this was an awesome question. I do get this question a lot because I, I definitely understand how definitely earlier on when shifts first started is obviously I was working with optional gymnastics. I was consulting with a lot of like, you know, optional teams and traveling across the, the country or world to work with teams as well. And so the majority of things that I was sharing were for that kind of bracket of age. Um, but that being said, um, I think it's important to remember that you can kind of take the principles that we talk about and apply them to any situation, depending on whether you're like working in recreational gymnastics, you're working in adult gymnastics, you're working in rhythmic, you're working in artistic, you're working in compulsory, high level, low level. It really doesn't matter. And the, and the one thing I want to start with here is no matter what setting you're working in or how much time you have in the gym per week, I think a really good kind of back of the envelope, you know, rule of thumb to work by is that about 30% of your time in the gym should be spent on physical preparation and basics and, and you know, uh, strength conditioning and stuff like that. So regardless of whether you're working with, you know, someone six hours per week, or you're working with someone 26 hours per week, about 30% of that time should be focused on strength conditioning. And so with that said, you know, so say you have, for example, here, so six hours per week, and usually what that means is someone's in the gym two days per week for three hours, right? We're thinking about either like, I don't know, younger compulsory level gymnastics or some other stuff that's kind of like transitioning to competitive gymnastics. It's usually what this bracket is for. Not that everyone's there, but it could be, you know, adult gymnastics two hours, three times or two times, three times a week. That could be totally fine as well. Um, but with that being said, if I had six hours with this group, right, and I had maybe three hours and three hours. I would be trying to spend at least one hour per day on some sort of physical preparation and strength and basics and conditioning and stuff like that. Now, that doesn't mean you have to spend a full hour block doing strength conditioning. Uh, I think you can break that up amongst a lot of different ways. And I'll kind of explain that now. So what I would personally do here, and if I was in your setting, Kim, is I would probably try to take the first, you know, 15 to 30 minutes, depending on what you're what you can do in your gym, your time, your space, all that kind of stuff. I would spend about 15 to 30 minutes doing a really good warm up. And I would actually add in some of the conditioning to that warm up, right? So you could do your normal dynamic warm up and your stretching and stuff. And maybe you spend five minutes or 10 minutes doing um, some core and some shaping and some active flexibility and some uh, different uh, positional holds and stuff like that. That to me all counts as some part of strength conditioning, right? Like doing the core work, doing some uh, arm and leg warm ups, doing some active flexibility, doing some kicks, doing some jumps and leaps. That is a little bit of both. And so I would probably sprinkle in a little bit of that into the warm up to try to get their bodies going and also kind of get them uh, started in the beginning. Some coaches like to add plyometrics in the beginning of their practice, which I'm a fan of as well. Not like we're doing, you know, 200, you know, ground contacts or like, you know, 25 minutes of ground contacts, but doing a little bit of high intensity plows over blocks and stuff like that, that helps get the nervous system kind of ready to go. So I would do that as a little bit. The second thing that I would do is I would try to put in one side station on each event that has some sort of um, strength and conditioning focus on it. So say you're doing half hour or 45 minute events, like in this situation, you could, you could do a half hour warm up and then, you know, a 45 minute event and then a 45 minute event. And then you could do another half hour of strength at the end within all of those stations. I might be doing, you know, one thing that's really, really important for that specific event, right? So for bars, for example, I'm always trying to put some sort of bar conditioning in as a side station, because it's oftentimes something that's really challenging to get all of your work in for. And it's also something that's really tough sometimes to just do an entire block of bar conditioning, because it's really, really challenging. And the focus levels are sometimes not there, especially with younger athletes, who it sounds like that's what you're working with. So I might put in one, you know, set of three leg lifts, or a cast handstand, or chin up pullovers, or V ups, or something like that 
that is very specific to um, the actual uneven bar skills that you're working on in that practice, right? So they might go through their circuit, they might do three leg lifts every time they go around, and that might have them come back, chalk up, do a side drill, do something, what else, then come back to me on the bar. So you could do that on bars for men's pommel horse, you could do some sort of shoulder prehab stuff, or you could do some sort of like, you know, tricep strengthening and extension for pommel horse swings on the side station, you could do some sort of side ring strength station in a, in a dream machine or a belt or with a partner or something like that. You could just sprinkle in a little bit of strength on every event. Okay. And then third is I would do the actual, you know, like I said, half hour at the end of more formal kind of block strength and conditioning. Okay. And now what you would put into that strength conditioning is, is quite a big question as well. But you know, if you had an hour, I might be trying to look at lower body, trying to get a nice balanced program of squatting and hinging, pushing and pulling step up split squats, um, push ups and pull ups kind of in the upper body, some upper back rowing, making sure we're trying to get all aspects of the core. So front back side side uh, and turning. So that's kind of a, a bigger discussion on what your strength and conditioning program would actually look like. But essentially, it's trying to be well balanced. We'd probably do that in a circuit fashion uh, because the kids that are a little bit younger have a shorter attention span. So maybe we set up six stations and we rotate them every 30 to 45 seconds. We go through two rounds of that, something along that nature. Okay. So hopefully that helps kind of just map out what you would do with a lower level uh, program or not lower level, just less hours per week. Right. So just only in there, maybe five to six hours per week. That could be a high school team. That could be a recreational class. That could be adult gymnastics. That could be, you know, I don't know. That could be a team as well that just doesn't have access to a lot of equipment and stuff or time during the week. But it's a lot of ways to do it. But like I said, try to keep about 30% of your time focused on physical preparation. The other 30%, I usually say, is going to be drills uh, and uh, technical development. And then the last 30% is actual um, you know, skills, routines, stuff like that. So a lot of basics are really, really important as well. Okay. Um, the next question here comes from Sarah. So Sarah says, how can we keep motivation up with gymnasts to do the more strength conditioning, uh, boring, sorry, to do the more monotonous, boring strength conditioning and basics? They always end up complaining that it's uh, a little bit too boring. It's too hard and always, and they always end up giving no effort. Okay. So this is a little bit more of a cultural problem, but I put it in here, um, in the strength conditioning side, because I know there's a lot of gyms out there that are amazing gyms, amazing cultures. And unfortunately strength is just sometimes really, really boring and sometimes hard to do. Um, so a couple thoughts here. So one is that on an overall concept, and I think Brett Wargo said this on a podcast, is you have to try to make sure you build your gym to praise the things that aren't the most like flashy and exciting all the time, because you're trying to praise the character and the work ethic and the doing the little things well and the, and the uh, process of investing hard work into it. So if you only get excited when someone catches a release or when someone does a new pass or when someone gets a new skill or someone does really well at a meet, but you never celebrate somebody working really hard on their conditioning or someone showing up to practice when they're really tired or someone just being a good person, being kind, right? Those little things along the way, you know, that's unfortunately going to breed a little bit of monotony and kind of like uh, attitude that comes with strength and conditioning. So I would say that's first. And I'm not saying that's you, Sarah. I'm just saying a general observation that I've noticed in the community is sometimes I've noticed gyms that don't care. They don't even watch you know, strength and conditioning really hard. They don't even do too much, uh, you know, observations. They're just kind of like sitting off in the corner, yelling people to do stuff. And they're not ever like praising or trying to make it a little bit more enjoyable. So that'd be my first thing is try to make a little bit more excitement around those things, right? Like praise the tight knees on, on leg lifts, praise the the really high effort uh, box jumps, praise the someone who's a little bit tired, but they're putting in all their best effort, praise somebody who, you know, sore that day or tired, but is still putting in the work ethic, right? Do things like that to try to promote that in your culture. And it will help out a little bit, particularly with the younger ones. The second thing I would say is, uh, I got this from my buddy, Nick Ruddick is he does this with drills and with stuff like that, but it can also be done with strength and conditioning is you can make a lot of the uh, different exercises with the same goal. Okay. So he calls this the same, but different in reference to doing one skill with lots of different drills so that the drills don't become boring if you do the same thing over and over and over again. Okay. The same thing can happen with strength and conditioning. So, you know, in your strength program that you want to get like your squats in your leg lifts in your pull-ups in your, your pushups, all that kind of stuff. It doesn't mean you have to do the exact same exercise every single time, every single week for all months of the year, right? You can research and find a lot of different ways to strengthen the same muscle groups, right? And squatting is a perfect example, right? I can think of 40 different squatting exercises that might be helpful. I might do two or three for a couple of weeks and then switch something up and then switch something up, right? We could do double leg goblet squats. We could do skater squats. We could do some sort of a step up. We could do some sort of a, a single leg roll to a squat jump. We could do single leg squats down to a hold and isometric contraction, right? Like there's a lot of different possible things we could do to keep it a little bit more interesting than just doing literally four sets of 25 squat jumps on a resi jump on a resi pit, like, you know, every other day for four weeks straight, like it becomes so, so boring. So 
that'd be my second piece of advice is try to switch those things up. Try to throw in some games here and there. Try to throw in some obstacle relay races. I, I, I agree that strength just has to be boring or monotonous and just done sometimes. But you can throw in a couple little things here and there to make it a little bit more interesting, like doing cast handstand contests or doing leg lift raises contests or doing some sort of a fun, you know, little obstacle course relay to end the conditioning circuit when it's really hard. I think those things go a long way uh, and they do kind of prep up the group a little bit to make them a little bit excited. And then it kind of balances out the stuff that's just really, really boring. So that would be advice piece three. And then lastly, kind of more on the personal level is I've always found that it's easier to motivate athletes and get them to do things when you yourself are a part of the hard work, right? So whether that means you're actually doing the strength and conditioning with the athletes once per week, I'm a huge fan of that. I don't think anything builds culture and trust better than that. Um, or you just take it upon yourself to work out and sleep a lot and eat well and uh, drink a lot of water and try to manage your stress like you have to lead by example the easiest way to make strength become the worst part ever is when you sit down and you yell at people to work out and you're just kind of there on your butt right so if, if the athletes see you not involved like i don't mean you got to do all their rope climbs or do all their pull-ups i just say be involved spotting stand up encourage them try to correct them be excited cheer them on right don't just give them an assignment go sit in the corner and gossip or be on your phone or go in the office and do paperwork like none of that stuff is going to reflect well on you and it's a very very easy way to get them to all either cheat or not want to put in every effort so hopefully those four things help a little bit because i know it's a tough area but i've had some hard experiences where you just got to kind of put your nose to the grindstone and say yeah we got to get through this it's tough um but i also think that there's a lot of ways to make it a little bit more exciting and to make it more encouraging your culture so hopefully that one helps out too sarah just a little bit um, Arlene wrote this one on Instagram. Thanks, Arlene. Arlene says, what is your opinion on general gymnastic strength testing versus functional testing? Okay. And so for functional testing, for those that might not be familiar, is a little bit more like of the traditional um, strength conditioning stuff like force plates or time gate tests and stuff like that. Um, this was an awesome question. I do get this one a lot. So the first thing I'll say is that both of those things, when you test strength and conditioning, they have to really have a proper time and place and purpose to get the most out of them. Okay. I have seen a lot of gyms, strength conditioning gyms and general gymnastics gyms that do an amazing job with their testing stuff. And it's very much built around a culture of um, cheering each other on in excitement and trying to push each other in a positive way and trying to really celebrate, you know, trying to, to work hard and trying to get more out of your, your program and your training and that it's never done in a malicious way. I've unfortunately seen some other gymnastics gyms where the strength and conditioning feels like a boot camp and the testing feels like something they could fail and they get talked down upon if they don't get enough leg lifts or left rope climbs or they make side-handed comments about little Susie who can't do this and it's kind of like a, a low-key uh, gossip fest. And um, I, I really encourage people if that's what's going on, it's just stop testing because it's not helpful. You're just beating people down. You're just making people feel bad about it. Um, there's, there's no need to be negative about the way they're doing things. So if you're in a gym where you're doing it in a positive way, you're promoting people, you're saying this is just how we, we see who's getting stronger and we celebrate who's getting stronger and more powerful and we want to help everybody out. And you just kind of tr treat it as data collection, right? You say, we're just measuring these things to see where we're at. And if it's good, if it's bad, we'll work on it together. We'll find a program. We'll find a plan. We'll make sure you know how to stay on top of it. It just has to be in a positive, uplifting way because it gets so, so brutal. It gets so brutal on your psyche if you're just constantly being compared to other people and saying you're not good enough and you don't have this. Gymnasts are already type A enough. They're probably already beating themselves up if they don't get enough leg lifts or rope climbs, um, but they don't need the extra pressure on top of somebody else doing that. So that said, um, if you use them in the right context, both are really, really good and really, really important. Say on the gymnastics side, I think the more traditional stuff that a lot of people look at is good. I think like leg lifts and rope climbs and and sprinting tests or um, plyometrics like springboard jump for height off a springboard is a really good test. Um, handstand holds, press handstands, um, all those things, the traditional stuff that you would see in a gymnastics gym for testing, I think they're really good. I think they're good to get gymnastics specific data about how they are manipulating themselves with their strength and power in a gymnastics setting, right? So it's one thing to test a squat jump on a force plate, which is great. We'll talk about that. But it's another thing to test like rebounding jumps or to test some sort of a gymnastic specific plyometric over like a springboard or stuff like that or a spring floor. So I would measure those things. I would measure the the leg lifts, the push-ups, the rope climbs, the handstands, handstand push-ups, um, other core stuff, core hollow hold, arch hold with good form. 
springboard for height. If you can make a little battery of tests that represent a good uh, exposure to some of those things and maybe do them every, I don't know, three months, five months, six months, whatever your gym kind of demands or whatever your gym um, hopes for in terms of the, uh, the level and the goal of their athletes. Um, but that just gives you really good data and information and use it again to make a plan to help the athlete and, and explain to them why you're doing it, explain to them what it means, explain to them how they can get better because of this testing, not that it's going to beat them down. So that'd be what I would do on the gymnastics side. On the specific functional testing side, um, a champion physical therapy where I work, where we, we treat a lot of gymnasts, we coach a lot of gymnasts in terms of like strength conditioning programs. They come and they work out and they lift. We usually do a, a quite a battery of tests. Do I should, does most of this, but um, a couple of things that th I think are really important are doing like a force plate jump. So looking at a single vertical jump on a force plate or some sort of uh, distance uh, gated test uh, for height. Um, that tells you just kind of raw force and power output of the lower body, but you can also do repeated jump tests, right? So you can do three or five in a row and look at the elasticity of how much um, they can recoil and they can retain that uh, energy into their legs. So you could do a one jump test. You could do a three jump test. We also do some sprinting tests. So we might do a, a 10 yard dash sprint test between some timed gates to see if someone just has explosive, qu very quick twitch power. And you could also do like a T test laterally where they face forward and they sprint side to a, about five minutes or five yards down this way, sprint five yards the other way and come back to the middle. That shows a little bit more lateral agility and speed. Um, and the, we, those are the main ones we do for lower body, but we also play around with like, you know, push ups or a med, seated med ball throw for distance. You could also do some stuff with a radar gun and throwing med balls or med ball slams. So we're still working through some of that kind of stuff. But yeah, doing a little bit of general testing is, is really, really helpful. Some people do like counter box jumps or reactive depth jumps. Those are awesome too, as well. Well, I think as long as you're using a test that has some decent validity and reliability in the literature, and again, you're, you're applying that in the right context of trying to help understand the athlete's profile of, of force versus, you know, velocity versus speed versus stiffness. Like if you understand the characters that you're looking for in an athletic profile, you can use those tests to then find out how you have to help the athlete work more. So I think there's more tests coming out. We're trying to learn more about this kind of stuff. But for right now, we have really good success doing both a mixture of gymnastics specific testing and general testing as well. So hopefully that helps a little bit, Arlene. And that's a great question. So I appreciate you asking that one. Um, the next one here comes from M. M says, how do you get stronger and more consistent tumbling in athletes? Um, great question. Um, I think there's a couple layers to this uh, that really go into the highest level of tumblers that I've worked with or people who I see make really good progress. Um, for me, everything with like skill development and gymnastics development on like a technical side, it always starts with basics, right? So in, in my mind, basics are like basic lines basic uh, body tension, right? And just basic understanding of shapes and shape manipulation. So I think in my last uh, coaching, you know, in my coaching years previously, when I made mistakes, when I was younger, I would skip these things, just go to the drills and the actual tumbling. Um, but if someone doesn't understand like flat lines, right, like laying on their back, laying on their stomach, handstand, hanging, which Nick Ruddick has taught me a lot about, if they don't understand how to just be a flat line and create really, really high level body tension and stiffness. So squeezing their glutes, core, ears covered, hips open, quads flexed, you know, calves flexed, ears reaching to the ceiling. Um, if they don't understand how to just create that really high level body tension and then use that tension to create shapes like an arch and a hollow and a corbett snap between those two things, if they can't do that on the ground or over a panel mat or just on a basic jump, it's going to be really, really hard to translate that to a fast, explosive, quick twitch tumbling uh, drill or any sort of basic tumbling drill you do. So I would start there. I would start with, do they understand straight lines, body tension and arch hollow snapping? I try to do some sort of basics every single day on every single event. So warming up on bars or being on floor, like just a little bit of a five, 10 minute warm up to get their body going, but also reinforce these basics. It's always in our warm up. It's always in some of our strength and conditioning as well. So that has to be the starting point there, right? If someone can't get their arms over their head, if someone can't open their hips, if someone can't show you a tight arch and they have mobility problems or flexibility problems or strength problems, you have to go back and fix those first. You have to give them circuits to work on their flexibility. You have to give them specific strength and conditioning to work on those things. And pending they're dedicated and they actually want to improve and do it, you can see a lot of good progress there. But if you have some who really struggles with shoulder or hip flexibility and you're trying to give them these crazy tumbling drills, you might hit some really big headaches first, whether it's injuries or whether it's just not doing the drills with good quality or something. Those unfortunately creep back up to get you. So once that's in place, uh, I would then move on to baseline strength, power, and some plyometrics, right? So baseline strength, as we talked about uh, earlier in the question, so just the legs need to be strong, the core needs to be strong to handle the forces of tumbling, right? So squats, uh, hinges like deadlifts or hip lifts, um, physio ball curling to get the hamstring stronger, weighted hip lifts for the glutes and the hamstrings are together. Um, single leg squats, double leg squats, lateral squats, uh, you know, RDLs, split squats, all that kind of stuff. 
and that forms the foundational layer of strength conditioning. If they're not strong enough and they don't understand body tension, they probably can't tune the floor and accept some of the forces and their legs will buckle, their head, their core will whip out, stuff like that. And then all the traditional core stuff, right? Like hollow holds, arch holds, side planks holds, V-ups, leg lifts, uh, hollow rockers. There's a bajillion different exercises, but getting a nice, well-rounded, strong core, super, super important as well. And then general plyometrics, general plyometrics being both on a spring floor of doing like bounding over panel mats or high blocks to tune the springs, but then also understanding general plyometrics, like on a, on a harder setting to do skipping and jumping and side shuffling and some sort of hurdle jumping, just tuning the floor, tuning the spring floor to get the elasticity out of their tendons. You need that baseline of strength and power and elasticity out of their plyometrics to get those things, excuse me, all those things together, right? With really good science-based applications there. So if there's a good science basing for how many sets, how many reps, how many days per week, what exercises and why, you can really develop the athlete's general potential and then tra transferring that over to the floor is much, much easier. Starting with the floor stuff or the tumbling stuff and trying to just get stronger as a result of that is really, really hard. And I, and I really encourage people not to do that, okay? Okay, once you have that baseline physical preparation, a lot of this comes from my buddy Nick after, is I think one thing I learned from Nick is having a really good understanding of the key points of performance or what he calls Kodak moments within the tumbling. So when you do a hurdle, where do your arms go? Where does your leg go? Where does your foot go? Where should your eye line and your vision be? What's the back leg supposed to be like, right? So slowing things down and teaching those snapshots through drills is really, really important. So go through each piece of the important part of a tumbling drill. So the round off, the snap down, uh, the, the takeoff position for a back handspring, the takeoff position for a back tuck, and try to look in a, and see what all those positions are, okay? So if the, if the athlete and you don't understand what basic key positions you're looking for, it's hard to teach them the proper way to do those kind of things. So you would take those things and you would set drills up to try to teach that tumbling mechanics with all the things we talked about before, but set up some hurdle round off drills, set up some snap down rebound drills, set up some snap down back tuck drills, trying to think about those key positions of what it should look like, okay? And important on that too, which Nick has taught me is a lot about the vision, right? Where are they looking? when they're doing things, when they're looking in their in their uh, hurdle, are they looking eyes up? Are they looking eyes down? Are they keeping their ears covered when they do their round off? Are they looking eyes on the floor? When they do their takeoff, their back tuck, are their eyes on the floor to keep their head down to prevent the whip? Like you have to teach them what that position looks like and what those eye sights are. And that's their reference point throughout tumbling. Okay. And then lastly, when you do those things, all of those things, I would strongly, strongly suggest that you do a consistency over intensity mindset. Okay. So don't take 17 drills and make this one epic two hour or one hour circuit on floor just to keep people busy and going and, and, and you know getting sweaty and working out take four things that are really really important key points of performance that you think they want to work on maybe it's the round off snap down maybe it's the rebound maybe it's the eyesight on a on a rebound for a back tuck but just focus on those three or four things and build circuits around those things so three circuits done to perfection it's like three drills in that circuit done to perfection, a couple side stations, and then tumbling into the pit. If you need to double up the station, so two of each station because you have a lot of kids in your group, that's fine. But I'd rather work on really high quality basics and really specific things consistently every other day when I get to floor or tumbling then one time per week, make a two hour drill circuit with 19 drills. That makes it a little bit overwhelming and makes it challenging to do uh, proper execution of those things. So that's a really important thing I think is happening. And the other piece of advice I would give that's always been a staple wherever I work, wherever I go to is having film and feedback loops. Okay. So I think the best thing a gym can do is buy a cheap iPad and buy cheap Apple TV or some way to stream it up to a TV and use the delay app. So you can delay a video recording up to like 20 seconds. Okay. So or even more, it's like a minute, but what this app does, it allows you to set it up on a drill or set it up on a station and you can loop it back to the TV 20 seconds delayed. So somebody can take a tumbling pass or do a drill. And then as they're standing in line, as they're waiting to get back in line, they can watch themselves go and either they can watch it and get feedback or a coach can stand there and say, can you see where your eyes are? Let's pause this here. Where are you looking here? see how your arms aren't up here you see how your hips are not open like they can break down specific things to work on and that can become a positive feedback loop of what to do versus just being like okay go ahead <laughs> you know go ahead and we'll get through it um i think sometimes that lack of visual uh visual cues unfortunately makes it tough sometimes for them to work on so hopefully those things all help them a little bit
Um, last one here comes from Mark. So Mark says, how does your approach to season change in, in cardio change out of season versus preseason versus in season? So this is a very, very good question. And I get this one and all the time people asking about what to do in season versus preseason versus, um, out of season. And I think the way that I like to look at this is I always have four buckets in my head of things that I'm thinking about. Okay. So in those four buckets are, uh, gymnastics skills, the gymnastics routines or whatever else, the, the performances pieces you're working on. That's one. Two is the strength. Three is the cardiovascular or energy systems training. And then four is going to be the athlete wellness or the physical preparation, or sorry, the, uh, the prehab and stuff like that. So in the off season, which here for in the States where I work is um, in the summer usually, but wherever it is on your part of the world uh, or your area, your type of discipline you're working in, in that off season, I think you want to obviously on skills, you want to be focusing on the gymnastic skills themselves. Are you getting new skills? Are you trying to move up in level? Are you trying to perfect old skills? Are you adding upgrades? Are you doing drills? Are you doing technical breakdown? All the stuff we just talked about in tumbling. That would be the, the main focus of the gymnastics stuff in the off season, which I think a lot of people know. Most people understand that they do that. You know, they take some time off after their hardest season or their hardest meet. They come back and they work on new skills. Okay, on the strength piece of it, I use this time, especially the first half of the summer, I use like six to eight weeks, as the majority of the time is focused on building their maximal strength and getting just raw strength to be stronger. Okay. The way we do that is I usually separate 50% of the time into general strength and conditioning and 50% of the time into gymnastics specific strength and conditioning, as we talked about above. So in general strength and conditioning, that's all we talked about before. Strength is like, you know, squatting and hinging and single leg stuff, step ups, upper body pushing and pulling vertically and horizontally, core stuff, right? Just uh, if you're, again, if you're in the gym six hours per week, I would try to put, you know, half of that time. So maybe 30 to 45 minutes should be spent on general strength conditioning. 30 to 40 minutes should be spent on gymnastic specific strength conditioning. If you're in the gym five days per week and you have full four strength days, two days might be on gymnastic specific strength. Two days might be on gymnastic uh, general strength, what I just talked about. Okay. The other spend on time, 50% is on gymnastic stuff. So rope climbs, handstands, leg lifts, push ups, plyometrics, um, core stuff, all that stuff is in the other half of the time as well. Okay. And when that happens, you can do, I, I personally like doing a little bit of gymnastic specific strength every day in the warm up. So I would do that every day. Then half the time would be on general, half the time would be on gymnastic specific. And the way you get that all in is you have to have a plan. You have to map those things out. You have to know what exercise you want to do. What days are we going to do it? What equipment do we have? What time do we have? What space do we have? Do we know how to teach a proper squat? Do we know how to teach a proper rope climb or a leg lift? You have to break those things down and do them all in a nice you know, plan that's periodized and has a nice breakdown and then you use binder sheets or however else you do it. But that's what the main summer focus is on. For cardio in the summer, I generally focus on overall health and fitness and general aerobic training. Okay. So this is usually done in the form of circuits, like 20 minute circuits where they have 10 stations, 40 seconds of work or 60, 50 seconds of work. And then they take a break and transition to another station. And you add in like upper body, lower body core or some light cardio work. And my goal of that in the summer is to just get the general body is a little bit healthier and fitter, teach the lungs to, to work harder, teach the heart to work harder, teach the body to kind of get some of that aerobic work going because strength is the foundation of power. And the aerobic system is very much one of the biggest foundational pieces of uh, anaerobic output, which is like a routine, which is like 60 to 90 seconds of work. So I'm doing general aerobic work in the summer. And then for athlete wellness in the summer is we're typically screening the athletes and we're making programs to help deal with nagging injuries, old stuff. We're trying to do some prehab work. We're trying to build those programs based off the screen. So that's what I do a lot of is doing that specific stuff in the summer as well. Okay, now moving into the preseason, early in the preseason, I think we're doing skill combinations is the main thing that we're doing. We're trying to get two or three skills together to, to see how these transitions would work or see if these combinations will work along with building up some endurance. So that's the main focus of the gymnastics side. The strength side is I focus on transitioning to more power stuff. So not like explosive power for only tumbling, but more doing things that are kind of like quick twitch in nature and are teaching the body to work really, really fast, right? So squat jumps and broad jumps and skipping jumps, deer jumps, ply metrics, um, med ball slams, uh, explosive jump cast handstands on a floor, all the things that work much, much quicker speed V ups, right? Like speed rope climbs, things that teach the body to use that new strength and work really, really fast sets the foundation for the, the in season or the preseason coming up where you really work on like explosive power and routines and stuff like that. So usually it's about four to six weeks in the beginning of the preseason. I work on that. 
usually September here in the States, um, but September and early October. And then for cardio is the same kind of idea. I'm working on changing the circuits to be more explosive in nature and kind of more in that 60 to 90 second window to try to set up the energy systems to be trained for what's coming up with um, more of the uh, intense cardio for routine. So we might be doing um, dance throughs on floor with sled pushes in between. We might be doing long basic sets on parallel bars for male gymnasts or for a high bar, just, you know, front up rise, swing, handstand, front up rise, swing, handstand, pirouette, um, dip, cut, dip, cut, handstand, handstand, back off easy, right? Like, and that's, I just made that up, but some sort of a longer sequence of basic events to teach them how to tolerate those shorter bursts of gymnastics specific stuff, but it's not as hard as doing like dismounts, right? It's not as hard as doing hard tumbling on the floor. Another really great example on tumbling is doing some sort of like tumbling into a pit. So a softer surface where they're not going to have to land hard, but run down, tumble, come back and around the floor while they wait, do some walking lunges, some handstand walks, some broad jumps on each a third of the lap. So they kind of get another stimulus of really hard leg strength or cardio strength, but we're not putting them in a dangerous situation where they're going to, they're possibly land short on their tumbling pass if they're tired. Right. So doing that is really, really helpful. I really enjoy doing cardio circuits as well. So uh, bar cardio circuits, that's kind of what it stands for, but jump on low bar in a uh, spot uh, for cast handstands on the coaches. So kip cast handstand three times, jump to high bar. If they're lower level, you know, set a 10, five tap swings to a dismount. If they're higher level, kip cast handstand giant, giant, giant to a layout, or just hop down if they're tired, run to a floor, 10 med ball slams, run to the rod strip, sprint, sprint, sprint. Then uh, while their four teammates are going, they chalk up, they wait in line. Okay, that's been a really, really effective way to get the cardio ready for a season, but not completely, you know, bury them hundred percent. And then athlete wellness wise, we do a ton of prehab education, right? So we're teaching you, how do you roll out? How do you take care of soreness? How do you sleep? Well, how do you do uh, your shoulder or hip or ankle rehab care? We're trying to teach them how to do these things to get them proactively ready for the season. Okay. The last half of that preseason uh, coming up is usually when we go to like half combinations or half, half routines, then moving into full routines or basic full routines, the power stuff becomes all gymnastics specific stuff. So, you know, skills and combinations and power tumbling and stuff like that. Um, we try to put more emphasis on that explosive power work and towards getting ready for routines. The cardio becomes more aimed at just doing routines. So we do half sets back to back in a, in a correction or full, full sets with a weak half correction, because that kind of serves as cardio. It also serves as getting the gymnastic stuff ready. And then in uh, the prehab stuff or the athlete wellness stuff is right before a season starts, we start quite a bit of education, right? Education on how do you sleep better? How do you feel yourself for performance? How do we work on mental stress? How do we work on getting ourselves our schedule prepared for school? So we're not stressed out in the winter when we we have tests to do and meets and stuff like that. We spend a lot of time educating the athletes to try to get them ready for in season because it's really, really challenging on them sometimes. And then in season is pretty much what most people know, which is just routines and meets and competing, right? The first half of season, we do our baseline sets that are just hit a good routine, doesn't have crazy upgrades, doesn't have anything, just get your level requirements. So that's kind of the first part of season is just getting your meets done and, and prepping for the meet and doing really well and getting consistent, figuring out what the routine is. For strength, uh, we're pretty much doing all gymnastic specific explosive power work. So all the traditional stuff, handstands, rope climbs, leg lifts, uh, speed sprints, vault sprints, uh, tumbling passes, bar routines, all that kind of stuff is the strength. And we do a little bit of maintenance care for the strength of like using weights and using the, the power work of broad jumps and all that, but uh, a lot of core stuff, but most of it's maintenance care. Uh, cardio is pretty much all designed at routines, right? And then lastly, the athlete wellness stuff is just building an extra time to do maintenance care, flexibility, um, prehab stuff, trying to give them 50 minute blocks to, you know, get their shoulders ready, get their hips ready, get their ankles ready. Um, we try to encourage them to work with physical therapists or athletic trainers or sports chiropractors proactively. So can you go get, you know, one every two, one session every two weeks? Can you get some hands on work? Can you get some nice PT done? Can you get some hands on manual therapy to keep your shoulders and hips ready? I do quite a bit of that at a champion during in season is keeping maintenance care type stuff like that up. Um, and that's the athlete wellness piece that I think helps a lot of people kind of stay just a little bit more together with, without feeling like they're, they're chugging along through band-aids at the end of their uh, season. Um, and then the second part of C season uh, in season is just uh, peaking, peaking for uh, championships, right? So upgrades add upgrades, try to make sure your set is flawless. Try to make sure you're going to hit when you need to doing hit percentages, stuff like that. Strength and cardio is all maintenance care, just doing the bare minimum to keep their, their bodies going and, and physical adaptation because you're not going to get super strong in season. You're just going to kind of maintain your power and strength and cardio. And then athlete wellness is just doubling down on, on trying to do that um, preventative care. Like we said, that prehab work. So just trying to figure out what that big meat is for the season, states, regionals, nationals, tapering and peaking towards that meat and trying to do hit percentages of meats as they go. So 
yeah, longer answer there, but I think that's one that deserves a little bit more uh, discussion because it's a little bit more nuanced and a lot of people have some questions there. So uh, thank you everyone for the questions. I think I wanted to try to keep that under 30 minutes and I was close. But uh, if people enjoy these uh, question and answer sessions, I can do my best to do more. We have a couple more coming down the road. So next week, we're going to talk about injuries. Then we'll talk about um, some flexibility. Then we'll talk about uh, culture development and making sure coaches are happy at the gym because a lot of questions are in those buckets from people that were submitted. So um, yeah, Mark, everybody else, thank you for the questions. If you guys enjoyed this, uh, like I said in the intro, just screenshot your favorite part, toss it up on Instagram. Let me know what you enjoyed. Let me know what was helpful. And then from there, we'll do more of these kind of things. And if people like them, uh, we'll get some more pieces together for it. So hope you all have a great week. Week and I hope you enjoyed these questions.